Okay, now let's see how sad can I make this. Hi there, Billy. <coughs> oh, it seems like you're working on a video that's connecting changelings and neurodivergence. Who the fuck are you? What are you doing in my chair? Well, my name is Leonard Dustus. I'm a legal representative for Mr. Theobald DeVille. Theobald DeVille? You are literally the devil's advocate. Now, according to my client, this paper here completely debunks the idea of changelings being connected to neurodivergence in any way. Go on. The paper is called Intellectual Disability and the Myth of the Changeling Myth by Goody and Stainton. Ah, uh, that thing. You know that's 20 years old and showing it, right? I think it still holds a lot of merit, Billy. Fine, go ahead. Well, first of all, most scholarship in favor of this hypothesis wasn't written until the 80s or 90s, making it mostly an idea of the modern era. I mean, yeah. With a few exceptions, such as Tourette's or epilepsy, proper research on neurodivergence didn't really start until the 1940s. And most forms of neurodivergence discovered then, since then haven't really become widely known until the 80s and 90s. So as long as we're following the concept of linear time, you wouldn't really expect people to start making these connections until the 90s, if there are any connections to be made. The professors go on to say that this idea assumes that the changeling myth was a way for parents to cope with the disability of their child. The parents would latch on to the idea of the child as inhuman in order to process and accept the disability. They would go from shock through rejection, anger, guilt, and projection to eventual acceptance of the child. However, this idea ignores the number of stories in which parents readily accept a changeling child without difficulty and treat it well from the start. No, yeah, I, I agree. That idea regarding changelings makes it sound like some kind of centuries-long mass hysteria, like it's some kind of Jungian collective unconscious horseshit. Um, and it does fail to take into consideration the the variety of responses to a changeling child. I agree with that too. It's also pretty fucking ableist, um, assuming that the only response to a disabled child would automatically be horror, as if disability is something to be horrified by. But that's not the interpretation that I'm using. And nor is it the only interpretation that exists. If we're instead looking at changelings as the way in which people understood disabilities that didn't have an obvious cause, then you would expect to see that variety of responses because that's what happens with actual disability. And because that's what happens with actual disability, it's what you'd expect to see in a mirrored in a myth about disability, which we do with the changeling. This argument feels like it's targeting a very specific and very weak interpretation of the concept and just ignoring the idea that there are other interpretations, including ones that are supported by the evidence here and not denied by it. Well, surely you agree with the professors when they say that separating intellectual and physical disability is a purely modern idea. Didn't Hippocrates tie epilepsy directly to the brain circa 300 BC? I, I, I can point to entries in the Ducas archive that directly tie epilepsy to changelings by name. You know, that, that's not important. It's not important for my argument. Within the myth itself, I don't see much reason to separate physical and neurological disability. There doesn't seem to be a huge amount of distinction, which is why I'm trying to talk about both of them together. Because there isn't much separation between them in the myth, I don't think it's particularly helpful or constructive 
to try and talk about one of them without acknowledging the other at the same time. And I don't think it's really possible to have a very constructive conversation where you're only addressing one and not the other. Now I'll admit, I'm probably showing some preference for neurodivergence, but this is likely because I have been neurodivergent my entire life, I've known about it for 27 years, I've been immersed in that culture and in that discourse for a very long time, whereas I've only become physically disabled in the past three or four years. So I'm probably leaning a bit more on the aspect where I have the most lived experience and personal knowledge. Were you surprised to hear the professor say that the earliest written sources on the changeling myth are not Germanic at all, but are instead Latin and come from sources within the church? No, I already knew that the earliest written sources were from the church. That wasn't a new information for me. Well, then you should be familiar with the earliest depiction written by William Doveron. That's not the earliest depiction. What was that, Billy? That text is from the 13th century, but the, the earliest written description of a changeling that we know of is a 12th century Vita Fabulosa describing the life of St. Stephen in which he was replaced with a changeling as a child. But do you mean this quote? You should not overlook what is said about infants whom the convention, vulgus, calls cambiones, about which the most widespread are old wives' tales, that they are the children of demon incubi substituted by female demons so that they are fed by them as if they are their own and are hence called cambiones, that is, cambisi, as if swapped and substituted to female parents for their own children. They say that these are thin, always wailing, drinking so much milk that it takes four wet nurses to feed one. They are seen to stay with their wet nurses for many years, after which they fly away, or rather, vanish. I do! And as you can see, this description shows no traits of neurodivergence whatsoever. Uh, remember what I said earlier about how it was mostly modern sources that were tying changelings to neurodivergence because that was when we started developing the understanding necessary to make those connections. This is kind of like that. By a 2001 understanding of neurodivergence, that's entirely correct. There is nothing in this quote to associate the changeling with neurodivergence. However, in 2013, Martina Barnovic Olsen published a paper in which she found that children who exhibit trouble with excessive crying, with difficulty sleeping and difficulty eating, within the first two years of life are far more likely to be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders in later life. She also suggested that this is probably due to the sensory processing issues that are associated with ASD. The thing is, sensory processing issues are also common in other forms of neurodivergence, such as ADHD and dyspraxia, so there is likely a similar association with those neurodivergences and the first two years of life as well. ASD can also cause a lot of problems around food, sometimes around regulating the amount of food eaten, sometimes with a need for sameness in food, uh, sometimes with a reluctance to eat in front of others. And I have found reference to stories about older changeling children who will only eat the same kind of food or will refuse to eat in company or both. So now with a 2021 understanding of neurodivergence, the line saying, these are thin, always wailing, drinking so much milk, that it takes four wet nurses to feed one becomes an indicator of neurodivergence. How many more of the quotations included in this paper make reference to difficulty with sleeping or eating or excessive crying? Two more for crying and three for eating. How many other quotes are included in the paper that describe changelings other than the one we've covered. Three. 
I'm not surprised because those are the most common changeling traits. The fact that they are also early indicators of ASD and probably dyspraxia and ADHD as well is very unlikely to be a coincidence. It would still be a mistake to think of this as a widespread belief of the period. As the professors say, even though vulgus can refer to the wider population, in theological circles it could also refer to one's ideological opponents. I mean, that's true, but given that the term vulgus in this context is being used in conjunction with the phrase old wives tales, that interpretation seems forced and a little bit desperate. It's stuff like this that makes this paper, for me at least, feel less like a genuine scholarly exploration of the topic and more like an attempt to justify a personal bias. But obviously the stories don't really focus on unusual behavior of the changeling child so much as the deceptive nature of the changeling and its supernatural abilities. If those are prioritized above any behavior that could be read as neurodivergent, surely that means neurodivergence is not an option. Are you fucking joking? My entire life, people have used my intelligence, my skills, my achievements as, as reasons to deny the existence of my disability, to, to say that I am faking it, that I am doing it to get attention, or because I'm lazy, or because I want extra things that other people don't get. This has only gotten worse since I have become visibly disabled. Now, disabled people aren't a monolith, but the vast majority of us will have similar stories. People are constantly monitoring us to, to see why we deserve our accommodations. They are constantly checking in to make sure that we're really disabled. If you can draw so well, then why is your handwriting so bad? If you can walk a little bit, then why do you need a wheelchair? It's part of the background radiation of disabled life. People think we're inherently deceptive, that we're lying to get free things and to, to, to make things easier for ourselves because we're lazy and not because we actually have problems. Now, as for the, uh, as for the supernatural abilities, on the rare occasions where we are depicted positively, in media. <laughs> it is usually some kind of nonsensical inspiration porn in which we are bestowed with superhuman fucking determination and positivity, or we are given straight up fucking superpowers. Rain Man, John Coffey, fucking Sherlock. Disabled and disabled coded characters, when portrayed positively, nearly always have superpowers. We, we nearly all can do magic. Fucking duddits in Stephen King's Dreamcatcher. Literally an alien sent to save the world. An alien. Do you have any idea how many times some weird hippie has said that my dyspraxia actually means that I'm vibrating on a higher cosmic plane and I'm actually a fucking wizard? I have been told that people like me are actually failed attempts from a government breeding program to create super soldiers. <laughs> the entire concept of the disabled child, who is a prodigy at some skill, usually music, is very similar to the stories where the changeling child reveals themselves by playing a set of pipes or a fiddle. Did these two run a single one of the ideas contained within this myth past an actual disabled person because it doesn't fucking sound like it? Well, the paper says that much of the literature in favor of this connection is based on the work of the Brothers Grimm. 
I mean, my viewpoint isn't because I hate the Brothers Grimm, but go on. Uh, uh, while Goody and Staten claim that the work of the Grimm Brothers couldn't really be considered folkloric because of all- Hold on, hold on, if they're going to tear into the Brothers Grimm, I want to read that for myself. It's, it's, it's basically a hobby of mine. Let me look this up. Okay, so shaped and reshaped the stories in a form that corresponded to their concept of an ideal folktale, adding and inventing proverbs, educational manual for children with good bourgeois upbringing. Uh, this checks out so far. They're moving on. Uh, this bit talking about Kuhn, Schwartz and Wutke is kind of conjectural. The authors say that these later collectors claim to have gathered their stories from old workmen and peasant women from various villages, but the, those stories bear a lot of similarity to the literary tales fabricated by the Grimm's. While I agree that's not good, the authors seem to be suggesting that Kuhn, Schwartz and Wutke have outright lied about their sources and just made those stories up based on the Grimm's and other earlier authors. The thing is though, it was common for 19th century collectors to genuinely collect stories from the working class informants, but then to alter them to fit their preferred literary style, even adding elements to the narrative. That possibility doesn't seem to have been considered here, and it certainly hasn't been acknowledged. Now, I don't see how that matters, Billy. The thing is, Goody and Staten are trying to say that the child substitution myth wasn't really a part of wider folklore before the 19th century when it was spread by people like the Grimm's. Now, if Kuhn, Schwartz and Wutke were lying about their sources, then that would be strong evidence in favour of that position. But if they were telling the truth about their sources and were actually just altering the stories they received to fit the pattern that they preferred, then that makes things a lot murkier. The Goody and Staten are only acknowledging the possibility that makes them right and completely ignoring the possibility that makes them wrong is very suspect. Uh, there's an entry there's an entry on the Ducas archive regarding changelings that says, About here, they didn't seem to know any effective way of getting the real child back. Stories of getting the real child back came from stories that were read. Suggesting that there was already an established lore surrounding the child substitution myth and that it was altered by the influence of 19th century folklorists. And I think it's very likely that the same thing would have happened in Germany. Also, I'll be honest, the understanding of folklore and how it works and what it is being demonstrated by Goody and Staten throughout this paper is about 200 years out of date. They, they keep trying to just draw a distinction between the clergy and the educated elites on the one side and working class people, the wider population on the other, and saying that one is folklore and one is not. And what's the problem with that? And what's the problem with that? It's a Grimmsian understanding of folklore and how it works. The idea that folklore is the sole possession of the working class is inherently Grimmsian. It's part of their fetishization of the working class. In the 21st century, how we approach folklore is with the understanding that all social groups have their own oral traditions. That includes class groups and it includes the upper or ruling classes. It also includes the church. And all of these social groups together, the folklore of each of these social groups together, comes together to build the wider oral tradition. Also, the traditions of those different social groups inevitably influence one another. You see, the word only is doing an awful lot of work. Saying it was only a belief held by the clergy 
and by the educated elite classes is the same as saying it was a belief only held by members of an organization whose purpose was to influence people's belief and it was a belief only held by the people in charge of society. That's an incredibly big only. Goody and Staten themselves describe how slurs like retard came into the wider public consciousness through the influence of the wealthier educated classes. Which helps to highlight how the dominant culture, the traditions, the folklore of the dominant culture inevitably influences the wider folk tradition because slurs are still a form of folklore. They keep presenting evidence against their position as if it's in favour of their position and it's really fucking weird. All they've really managed to say in this paper is that prior to the 1800s the child substitution myth was only a part of the folk traditions of the clergy and the ruling classes and they haven't even managed to do that very convincingly. But even if that was true it was still part of the wider folk tradition from the early 1800s to the mid 1900s and the fact that it leaked in to the wider tradition from other parts of the tradition doesn't negate that. Oral and literary traditions inevitably influence one another. Very few of the arguments in this paper actually stand up to scrutiny. They tend to be straw manning, factually incorrect, since proven wrong, or to be stretching reason further than Michael Jordan's arm at the end of Space Jam. Now I'll be entirely honest. Very little of the scholarship on this topic, whether for or against, has been done by disabled people and it shows. Little to know of the academic work on either side of the debate shows any consideration for the lived experiences of disabled people and how disabled people view ourselves. And scholars on both sides of the debate make an awful lot of assumptions and arguments that are kind of bigoted. But this paper in particular, I wouldn't even wipe my arse with it.